Thank you, Adolfo. So uh, let me start with um, thanking the organizers for putting together this nice workshop and also for inviting me here to this nice place. And also thank you uh, for staying uh, with me, on hopefully until the last minute. I, <laughs> I actually, I, did, uh, I cannot imagine why you're not already uh, you know, uh, relaxing on the beach, maybe because of the weather. <laughs> All right, so I, uh, today I want to talk about a rapidly uh, developing area in topological uh, material research, which is to um, use nonlinear responses to study topology and the geometry of um, quantum materials. Okay, and up till now, this shouldn't be something new to you. Actually, all the physics I want to cover in my talk has already been talked about. So actually, you really, you can go. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but, <laughs> but one thing, um, okay, let me first ask a question. And the question has already been asked by Philip. Uh, but now I wonder how many experimentalists left in the audience. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> still got to feel. So I don't know whether you agree with me or not. I feel uh, maybe uh, one better thing that experimentalists can do slightly um, nicer is to use schematics and animation to illustrate the physics. <laughs> and that's what I'm gonna do in this talk. And uh, uh, in order to do that, you have to forgive me for being a bit loose on certain aspects, because otherwise the schematic, the cartoon will be very complicated and we lose the point. Um, also, I will tell you a bit how to identify the real world materials uh, to look for uh, the exciting physics and uh, eventually how to do the measurements. Okay, so uh, just for the students here and also for people who are new to this uh, direction, I want to introduce a few nice review articles, uh, particularly combining theory and experiment. Uh, the first one is from Takura, uh, Takura and uh, Nagaosa sensei and the second one, shamelessly, is from myself and one of the organizers and also the session chair here and my colleague at Boston College. And there is another one uh, from, uh, I think, Ivasa sensei and also one from Joe Moore and uh, uh, David, David Xie. Um, Okay, so topology and geometry. So we know uh, one is a global property and the other is a local property. If we are talking about manifolds, uh, classical manifolds in real space, uh, it's very easy to visualize that, to imagine that, right? So the global property here is just the number of holes and the uh, local property is the curvature on the surface. They are related very nicely uh, by this Gosponet theorem. But what we concern here is electron wave functions and the topology and geometry constructed by the electron wave functions. This is much, much more abstract. Uh, but nevertheless, it has this beautiful relation, uh, you know, the integral of the Barry curvature, which is locally defined in, a, uh, in every K point. Uh, the integral of them over the entire brain zone gives rise to this total uh, churn number. And this is the global property. Okay, but still, it is very, very abstract. So where is our manifold, right? Um, right? I know um, um, other uh, theory, uh, theorists have some way to, 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 to exp uh, explain this. And uh, as an experimentalist working on graphene for a decade, I want to use graphene to illustrate, to, uh, to, you know, to generate a manifold for you. And then we can visualize you know, where is the global property and uh, what is the uh, local property. Okay. So graphene is a very nice model. Oh, so by the way, this model is not invented by me. I mean, it's motivated by Professor Hodden's uh, famous video on YouTube, if you uh, haven't uh, looked at. Um, so graphene, we all know that it has two sublattices, right? A and B sublattices. So oh, give me one minute. I, I want to. I think it doesn't work. Okay, 
this work better. Okay, so graphene has uh, two sublattices, A and B, and therefore the quantum state can be represented on the block sphere. Can be represented on the block sphere. So here, uh, the, uh, uh, in uh, uh, in the uh, pseudo spin language, here the spin up is A sublattice, and spin down is B sublattice. Okay, so uh, for pristine graphene, which has both inversion symmetry and time reversal symmetry, the important consequence is that any state has to be equal weight superposition between the A and B. And therefore, the pseudo spin has to live on the equator. So, uh, and uh, here is how the pseudo spin winding around these two, uh, uh, two, uh, two valleys. Uh, K and K prime in the momentum space, and all the pseudo spins have to be on the equator. Okay. Now let's draw a loop in the K space, which does not enclose the K point or K prime point, and see how these states can evolve on the block sphere. Okay. And you can see here, from here to here, the pseudo spin uh, winding from here to here, and from us. Uh, sorry, from yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know. So this loop. Uh, is mapped onto the single curve, and this single curve does not enclose any solid angle. If we make this loop infinitesimally small, we can define a curvature which is zero. Okay? We do not have uh, a non-zero barrier curvature in this case because we have both inversion and time reversal symmetries. Now, in order to bring non-zero barrier curvature, we have to break either inversion or time reversal symmetry. And there is a special case here, which is proposed by Professor Hauden, how to realize the chain number, and we will use that to bring out uh, the, 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 uh, the barrier curvature. So, in the so-called Hauden's model, we break the time reversal symmetry, and the consequence is that you know the pseudo spin at K and K prime are now fully polarized to A and B sublattices. And moving away from this high symmetry point, K and K prime, the pseudo spin gradually moves back to be on the equator. Therefore, we have this texture okay, of the pseudo spins. And now let's do the same, uh, same analysis of this K loop. And you, uh, you will see now this loop is a finite area on this block sphere. And uh, apparently now, if we bring this loop to infinitesimally small, we can define a non-zero curvature. And that is the, uh, the barrier curvature in this case. So, and from, uh, so, so, so you can see uh, uh, this curvature is really a local property that we can define around any, uh, uh, for any k point in the momentum space, right? You, can, uh, you just uh, draw the loop around different k points. And where is the global uh, property? Okay, uh, for that, we have to consider all the pseudo spins in the momentum space. And let's just put all the little uh, arrows onto the block sphere. And you will find that they precisely cover the entire block sphere once and only once. And that corresponds to our uh, uh, topological invariant, uh, chain number one. And if they cover this entire block sphere twice, then you will have chain number two. Okay, so with this picture, we can also visualize this so-called bulk edge correspondence. And to do that, we just uh, you know, draw the web functions in, in the real space. Okay? So let's first draw the uh, web functions according to these three K points. Okay, uh, so here, uh, you know, the pseudo so spins have to uh, have to be polarized to the A sub lattice, and therefore, these well functions will be propagating according to the directions defined by these three k vectors on the A sub lattice this way. Okay, and for these three k prime. Uh, points, uh, they are on the uh, B sub lattice. So the web, uh, the web functions propagating um, uh, along the directions of K prime, but on the B sub lattice. And the consequence is that now uh, you can see in the interior, we have the localized orbitals uh, with the 1D propagating edge on the sample boundary. So this is the bulk edge correspondence. Okay. So this just uh, you know try to convert the formulas and the equations to this cartoonish picture. Um, 
Okay, so next I want to make a few points about this geometric properties and topology. And uh, these are uh, already <coughs> mentioned by uh, previous speakers, I just put them together. So the first point I want to make is, even in a non-topological context, meaning we do not have a strict topological invariant in the system, these geometric properties could all, uh, all, um, already lead to interesting phenomena. Okay? A famous example is this anomalous Hall effect, which has been mentioned many times. So this anomalous Hall uh, effect uh, uh, you know, is described by this anomalous Hall conductivity, which is the integral of the Barry curvature over the uh, momentum space. And here, as long as we do not have time reversal symmetry, you will find that the Barry curvature between k and minus k won't be canceled with each other, so we'll have finite anomalous Hall conductivity. So basically, in any magnetic metal, we can have this anomalous Hall uh, effect. It doesn't have to, uh, to, it doesn't have to be topological. But of course, in the uh, topological context, we have this very exciting quant uh, quantized analysis of Hall conductivity, where this integral gives rise to, to the Chen number in an insulator. Okay? So the second point is, uh, even when the total barrier curvature is zero, okay, uh, in the previous slide for the anomalous Hall, the total barrier curvature curvature in the momentum space is not zero. But even for the case when the total barrier curvature is zero, the distribution of the barrier curvature um, in, the, in the momentum space could lead to interesting phenomena. Okay, so uh, how to visualize this? So um, imagine we are dealing with a 2D uh, uh, space, so the barrier curvature is just a number, uh, it could be positive or negative. So in the momentum space, some, some part is positive, some part is negative, and we have this dipole distribution of the barrier curvature. We could also have this quadruple-like distribution of the barrier curvature. And for both of the cases, you can see if you integrate the barrier curvature, it is zero, but it is clearly have this nice di distribution. Okay, so I remember there was a poster about this barrier curvature quadruple, which leads to some third order response. And uh, in this talk, I will focus on the dipole, which is a simpler case. Um, all right, so, and the third point is that even when the barrier curvature is zero, that's not the end of the story. Bernavik told us that uh, we have uh, some, something called quantum metric, which is another geometric quantity uh, that uh, describe the wave functions, and uh, the quantum metric uh, can lead to interesting phenomena as well. Okay. Uh, here is, uh, just to repeat some, something what uh, Andre has already told us. So, uh, you know, the quantum metric uh, is uh, completely described by this tensor, which has the real part and the imagined part. Again, this equation is not precise, <laughs> please forgive me. Uh, so the real part is quantum metric and the imagined part is a barrier curvature. Both of them are quite interesting and significant. Um, okay, and the last point is that symmetry is important here to study all these properties. The space group or magnetic space group determines whether we have non-trivial geometric quantities and how these geometric quantities are uh, um, distributing the case space. Okay? And because of that, now I want to introduce the second order responses uh, which are symmetry sensitive tools that allow us to study these geometrical uh, properties. Um, again, this is already covered by John and other speakers. So the second order response uh, have, um, uh, I mean, simply put, has these two, uh, two, two categories. And the first is the second, uh, second harmonic generation, meaning uh, uh, from uh, omega excitation, we get uh, omega plus omega to omega response. And another one is this photocurrent generation or intrinsic photogalvanic effect, where you know the uh, omega uh, excitation leads to a DC response, omega minus omega. Uh, and um, they are described by this chi 2 coefficient and this generic formula. Okay. So, um, so uh, just a 
quick way to understand why this chi 2 coefficient is so sensitive to the symmetry. This already been introduced by Julian. Uh, so very quickly go through this. So let's apply, uh, let's now apply inversion symmetry transformation onto this generic formula, okay? Uh, I, J, K to minus I minus J minus K. So the P will gain a minus sign and uh, both E's, both electric fields will gain a minus sign. And therefore you can see the left side has one minus and the right side has two minus, okay? Uh, the important thing now is this chi 2 coefficient. The chi 2 coefficient is a pure material property. If the material itself has inversion symmetry, then chi 2 remains the same. And as a result, we have a second uh, equation here, which has a minus sign compared to the first one. Therefore, in order for both to hold, the chi 2 coefficient must vanish identically. That's the analysis of inversion symmetry. You can do this analysis with applying mirror symmetry, rotational symmetry. You will find that a subset of the chi 2 coefficients will have to vanish. Okay? So therefore, uh, uh, you know, uh, especially in this uh, optical SSG measurements, you can, uh, uh, by mapping out all the, uh, all the chi 2 coefficients by changing the measurement configurations, you can really map out the space group symmetry of a material. So this optical SSG has already been introduced to quantum material research and study topological materials and correlated materials. There have been many nice experimental works. So one thing I want to point out is the excitation energy of this measurement. Okay? So normally these measurements are done in near infrared and visible, or UV, which means the energy is around 1 EV. But if you uh, look at, you know, uh, the band structures of the topological materials and correlated materials, the interesting states actually lie at low energies, right? And therefore, you know, by using one EV excitations, we're actually far away from the interesting states that we care about. But of course, you know, experimentalists are trying to push in the frontier uh, and moving the, uh, the frequency down. That is not easy, but uh, there is uh, uh, nice progress. So here, I want to uh, 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 tell you that actually the second order responses can be measured uh, in different experimental setups. And by doing this, we, we actually lower the, uh, uh, the, the, the technical barrier for performing this, uh, this nonlinear uh, measurements. So uh, why this optical SSG is challenging? It's because you know, we excite with the light, we also measure with light, right? And we have to distinguish a two omega frequency uh, response from omega frequency excitation. So we need uh, wavelength sensitive optics and that poses a lot of challenges for us. Um, so it turns out, if you think about it, for people who are doing transport, so it's our daily routine to perform this locking, uh, this frequency locking measurements to measure the linear response. I can tell you that you know, for the same setup, we can just uh, uh, turn, turn a button and uh, uh, to choose two omega uh, as our locked frequency for the response. And then we can measure two omega response to an uh, omega uh, excitation uh, electrical signal. And this is basically an electrical version of the optical SH measurement, and it is very easily done in very low frequency near DC, uh, even to microwave frequencies. Uh, and uh, we are very close to the Fermi surface in this region. And another thing is the photogalvanic effect, the photocurrent generation. So basically here we can cover a wide range of energy excitations. Why is that? So compared to this pure optical measurement, here you see the excitation is light, but the response is the electrical signal. So just by the measurement, the excitation and the response are automatically separated. We do not need any wavelength sensitive optics. So it's just, it's, uh, it's, it's automatically separated. Okay, so, uh, so my point is if we combine you know, uh, a device, 
a device structure with all the contacts and combine the electronics, the locking amplifier, and combine with the optics, we can basically choose the excitation frequency that we want to study uh, the states that we are interested in. And in the first uh, uh, lecture, I will uh, focus on uh, you know, the, elect uh, the electrical SSG measurements, which to combine a device structure and electronics uh, to do the measurements. Yeah. And more specifically, I'm talking about second order anomalous Hall responses, which you know, all the, um, many of the theorists have already set the stage for me. Um, so, uh, Second order anomalous hall. Uh, then we need to uh, first uh, just briefly go through the linear anomalous hall, right? So for both the regular hall effect and this linear anomalous hall effect, we need uh, either external magnetic field or a net magnetization for um, total bar uh, barrier curvature uh, effect. And for this nonlinear anomalous hall effect. Okay, so we inject a current at frequency omega, and we measure this voltage at two omega. So the DC is always uh, accompany the two omega response. Um, and for this uh, response, we, 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 we don't require magnetic field, and also we do not require net magnetization. So, and... Uh, the way to understand this, so, um, uh, so for realizing uh, this nonlinear hall, we can preserve this time reversal symmetry, but we have to break the inversion symmetry. This can be first, I mean, understood because it is a second order response, right? Um, I already show you that for any second order response from a material, we cannot have inversion symmetry. So we cannot have inversion symmetry. This can also be understood from the barrier curvature. If we have both, the barrier curvature is zero. So we have to, if we want to preserve the time reversal, we have to break the inversion, okay? So in this scenario, we have this, barrier, uh, this uh, dipolar distribution of the barrier curvature. So you know, K and minus K are opposite. Um, due to uh, the time reversal, right? So uh, this dipolar distribution of barrier curvature has been formalized by Professor Liang Fu and Inti Sodman um, uh, uh, when, when he is still at MIT. Uh, of course, this is built upon some pioneering work from Spivak and Joe, uh, Joe Moore, Joe Arnston. Um, so, and the formula is like this. The barrier curvature dipole is some kind of gradient of the barrier curvature and the integral uh, over the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the momentum space. And we have a nonlinear uh, non uh, Hall uh, current that is proportional to two electric fields and also proportional to the barrier curvature dipole. This has already been derived by Julian, so I won't uh, talk too much. Again, so I want to convert that equation into an illustration, okay? So it's actually very simple. So it's a net barrier curvature in a current carrying state, okay? This is the equi uh, equilibrium state. K and minus K has opposite barrier curvature, so they cancel with each other during the integration. Now, if we apply electric field, the Fermi surface is tilted, right, and then we we lose some barrier curvature on the left side, but we gain some barrier curvature on the right side. And in this current carrying state, we have this, we have this total barrier curvature. And from this simple picture, you can uh, appreciate that the electric field has to be along the same direction uh, as the dipole moment. Otherwise, you can imagine if the electric field is along this direction and shake the, uh, the Fermi surface this way, you won't have this, uh, this net barrier curvature. Uh, curvature. Um, so then, okay, then we have uh, um, with the second electric field uh, that drives the barrier curvature, we can get a hot, uh, hot signal. This is a quite simple picture. Uh, and for an experimentalist, the question now is how to find this material system that allows us to study this effect. Um, this, um, again, go back to the symmetry, uh, symmetry guidance. So this barrier coach dipole is a pseudo-vector, 
And the, in a 2D, uh, we, uh, I will tell you why 2D material uh, have advantages later on, but if we confine our search now uh, on 2D materials, this barricade dipole is the pseudo vector lining on the plane. Okay? In order to have this vector, we, uh, of course, we cannot have inversion center, and also we cannot have any out of plane rotational symmetry. If we have C2, C3, or C6, so uh, you can imagine there will be equivalent uh, vectors, okay? And all the vectors will cancel to, uh, to zero. Similarly, we cannot have simultaneous orthogonal mirrors for the same reason. And this requirement immediately excludes these materials, these are our favorite materials from graphene to semiconducting TMDs to this boronitrite and other other materials with the hexagonal, um, sorry, with the uh, hexagonal honeycomb lattices, right? So then uh, we turn to this uh, uh, transition metal dichotinite called TD phase tungsten dactylite. This material has also been introduced by, uh, by Pre. Uh, so this material is very interesting for many reasons, uh, from you know, very large magnetic resistance due to the compensated electron hole pockets. It's also type 2 by semi-metal predicted by Bernovic, and it has these hydrodynamic uh, properties uh, just uh, described by Pre yesterday. And the monolayer of WT2 is a quantum spin hole insulator. It shows superconductivity upon electron doping and it's also arguably uh, an excitonic insulator with correlations. So this is a layered material, so we can uh, use the scotch tape technique to exfoliate monolayer or bilayer or trilayer, just like a graphene. So what we care about is its low symmetry here. So uh, this is the common uh, semi, uh, semiconducting TMD uh, materials, which has this rotation symmetry. And this tungsten dactylite has this distorted T phase. And this distortion removes all the rotational symmetry and leaves only one mirror plan here. And particularly in bilayer, this stacking of these two layers in the natural lattice breaks the inversion symmetry dramatically. So it is the uh, the the, the the, the good candidate. And uh, this remaining mirror plan uh, make the dipole uh, uh, simple. So, so this dipole as a pseudo vector has to be perpendicular to the mirror plan, is, is, is well defined. And this bilayer WT2 is, uh, uh, turns out to be a very nice candidate uh, because it has the correct symmetry and also it has large barrier curvature. So this is a good example that a material that is not strictly topological can have very large barrier curvature effect. And uh, also it is a 2D system. It has a very nice tunabilities with the gates that can allow us to e explore a large prime space to compare with theory. Okay, uh, as, uh, so, so as, as an experimentalist, uh, we uh, now start to build our device for the electrical measurements. So we put down the contacts, okay? And also we have these gates, the top gate and bottom gate, okay? Uh, so it's basically, it's a cup capacitor structure to induce carriers into the system. If, apply, if we apply these two gates symmetrically, okay, we keep the potential difference between the two layers um, the same, but we inject carriers into, the, uh, into this system. If we apply these two gates asymmetrically, uh, the total charge will remain the same, but now we introduce the potential difference across these two layers. And that will change the electronic structure of this material dramatically. Um, and um, this material is very anisotropic, so just by looking at it under the microscope, we can already know uh, which direction is A and which direction is B, along which we should have the mirror plan, et cetera. So we, can, uh, we, we, we already know the barrier dipole should be along what direction. And then we do this measurement. 
So uh, according to uh, this formula, you see this electric field, this excitation field has to be along the direction of the Barker's dipole. That's uh, why we you know, flow the omega current along this direction and then measure, uh, uh, sorry, then measure the voltage uh, uh, in the transverse direction. And we measure, uh, we lock the frequency to two, two omega for the, uh, for, the, for the response. So we have this, um, this, this V2 omega that grows quadratically as a function of the current. This is different from linear response. You will have this omic linear relation. So here is quadratic because the V will be I squared. Okay. And another thing uh, that we can check is uh, how um, consistent are these measurements. So I, now I show you many uh, different sets of measurements by using different contacts. So as long as these contacts uh, are uh, um, collecting the transverse response, we have this large two omega signal and all the curves are laying on top of each other very nicely, very consistent. And it's not uh, you know, contact specific or area specific, etc. And this, these curves are measured by using contacts just on one side, which means we only measure the longitudinal uh, uh, two omega response, which are basically zero. So this is really a hole response with a very large hole angle because the, uh, the, 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 the symmetry uh, uh, makes the, 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 the longitudinal response vanish. Um, yeah? So it's like that, is it? Um, you go from one band to the other, it's a gate voltage, it's back gate voltage with you, or what is it? Oh, the, uh, I mean here, the back gate voltage, it tune, it's tuning the chemical potential mostly. Uh, right, so this uh, sort of a heartbeat shape is because you go from band to band? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. From the valence to, 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 to the connection bands, the barrel just switch side. Um, okay, and there is another uh, nice measurement from the Cornell group, and here they have this flower-shaped contact, and with this many contacts, they can rotate this whole, um, whole probe, you know, uh, so, so they can test another important thing of this equation, which is, you know, the electric field. If this electric field is perpendicular to the barrier dipole, this response should vanish. And th this is indeed what, what they see here, right? So the, so the maximum response is, is similar to the previous slide, is when the electric field applied along the dipole direction. And this, this zero is when they are orthogonal to each other. And, yeah. Dashed line is, is what it's supposed to be, like some sort of... Yeah, some fit, yeah, so, so some, it, it, some, some formula, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and in this paper that also analyze, you know, this, uh, the scaling on um, um, relaxation time, and they find the, the contribution from both the intrinsic barrier curvature and also uh, scattering. So, so here I, I will intentionally, uh, you know, just discuss the intrinsic part. And uh, in our work, so we decide to, uh, you know, extract the Barker's dipole from this equation. So this re relaxation time we can calculate from the linear response roughly, and we compare this experimentally extracted Barker dipole with the DFT calculated Barker dipole. Okay, so I want to. Um, um, mention, highlight that this is not a one-point comparison. As I mentioned here, we have two gates. With these two gates, we can tune this chemical potential, tune the Fermi level, and we can also change the band structures without uh, you know, changing to uh, many other material parameters. It's in situ. So in that way, uh, you know, so we are actually explore a very large two-dimensional parameter space, and it turns out in such a large parameter space, we get quite nice consistency. Okay, just to summarize, so we, uh, we think we observe this nonlinear hot signal from this barrier dipole, intrinsic origin, and uh, vice versa, the nonlinear hot signal can be a way to measure barrier curvature properties in non-magnetic materials. 
And if we um, are dealing with a 2D material with the gating ability to move the chemical potential, we can actually measure the barrier curvature in an energy resolved way, like in this case. And uh, so, so, so after the tungsten deteriorate, people found many other interesting materials show this nonlinear Hall response. And this is in a review paper two years ago, and now I, I, I bet this list has grown up substantially. So another direction, which I just, yeah. I guess one of those not questions, but not questions, but comments, is that since this is a DC measurement, mm -hmm. You're really measuring uh, uh, everything, you know, the side jump, con yeah, extrinsic yeah, yeah. contributions yeah. too. Yeah, so yes. to say that you're measuring uh, barrier curvature dipole is is probably not not quite, uh, you know, not quite right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right. so as I said, the scattering is always there. So it's just uh, you know by uh, comparing uh, with the theory and also by. I know the, the the scaling analysis is also not quite quite reliable. Um, you just have a substantial contribution from the barrier culture. Right, but it, it, the side jump is indistinguishable yeah, 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 from, I know. from, yeah, yeah, from yeah, barrier yeah, curvature. Yeah, yeah. So, and but, but for side jump, if you calculate this, will that uh, show all the same dependence as barrier curvature? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, it, it, the sign will yeah. be the opposite, but otherwise they are pretty yeah. much the one is expressed, you know, yeah. through the other. Yeah. So it, it's, the, Im it's impossible mm, to separate them, I think. Yes. Uh, yeah. And another thing is, these materials, most of these materials, the mobility is very poor. It's not in the very ultra ultra clean limit yet. But but this this is actually good for side jump, if you will. Exactly in the dirty limit, side jump will look exactly like barrier curvature. All I your tiles will will cancel out. Okay. So it, it's you know being uh, you know having a dirty sample is exactly when the side jump is exactly like barrier curvature I with see, the opposite sign. But the skew scattering is on the other limit. Yeah, skew scattering is wins on the when, clean yeah, limit. If, so, if so doping I, is high yeah. or mean free path is very long, then, then skew scattering will win. Yeah, that, yeah, I totally agree that mm. we cannot distinguish this two. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's why, um, yeah, I bring this slides so 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 we are just uh, consider you know in the diffusive regime uh, without a scattering uh, contributions uh, for that so just like the linear response we uh, we will have ballistic regime hydrodynamic regime and we need to consider scattering and the interaction effects so there are uh, many papers I'm, I may have to update my list I think one of this is Dimas right <laughs> so <laughs> to uh, discuss this scattering effects and maybe uh, one or two papers about the ballistic regimes and experimentally and people indeed find a uh, uh, skill scattering that can, 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 can give rise to some transverse response even under rotational symmetry, even when there is no barrier dipole. Uh, okay, so, the, uh, so just quickly uh, mention, okay, this, this, this kind of, uh, not intrinsic, I mean uh, homogeneous materials giving rise to this, uh, this second order electrical response can be used for energy harvesting. So the two omega response is always accompanied by a DC response, and this is electrical re rectification. So basically, we can turn a radiating electromagnetic waves into a DC voltage that we can harness this for you know, charging uh, your phone and etc. So this is often realized by the pin diode or shocky diode, and here we have the, uh, this quantum materials maybe that can do the same thing. And this is uh, already demonstrated in this material that Julian just talked about, the tungsten iridium telluride, which has exactly the same symmetry as tungsten telluride and very similar electronic structures. And uh, they show, you know, they can harvest a Wi-Fi signal and convert it into a DC voltage. And they think this is due to the nonlinear Hall response. Uh, okay, so uh, for the next maybe 15 minutes, I want to talk about uh, a, a more recent development. So it turns out, you know, for the other geometric quantity called qu uh, quantum metric, so we can have uh, a similar dipole uh, nonlinear Hall effect. This is maybe related to yesterday, um, the referee has point, what is the <laughs> consequence of the quantum metric? This is probably one of the uh, examples. Okay, 
So after Bernard's talk, I don't, I probably don't need to show this slides to convince you the quantum metric is very important. Uh, uh, a brief recap, the quantum metric describes how different the uh, two quantum states, uh, the two nearby states are, okay? So, uh, so there has been a growing list of literature talking about you know, how this quantum metric is important in flat bands, in test of bilegraphene, uh, et cetera. Um, okay, so just, um, again, to convert some of the formulas yesterday from Bernavik slides into, into cartoon. So uh, let's imagine uh, within each unit cell, we have two different orbitals, alpha and beta. Okay. And in case space, we consider two nearby quantum states, K0 and K0 plus delta K. Okay. So that uh, you, can, you can see you know, the distance between these two states will be uh, zero if these two states come from the same orbital. So that the inner product uh, will be uh, one. Right? Uh, right? If they are orthogonal, pure, uh, uh, completely orthogonal to each other, we'll have a, a maximum distance. That's what the quantum metric can tell us. Now, if we have an atomic insulator and the valence and connection bands, and all the states come from the same orbital, and the, uh, we have a trivial uh, metric zero, because this inner product will be, zero, uh, will be one. Uh, if we have a topological insulator, we have a band inversion, right? So the band inversion uh, means the mixing of the states and the hybridization, etc. So we will have a, sub a substantial change of the orbitals um, uh, for the nearby states. And in this way, we have non-trivial me uh, metric. This is just a loose uh, consideration uh, why the topological materials are uh, important here. Um, so... You know, for this slide, I, 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 I was not able to find a very, uh, very, very nice, uh, very simple uh, cartoon to illustrate, so I have to throw out some equations. So it turns out from these uh, papers, um, if the quantum metric is non-zero, uh, applying electric fields can drive a, con a correction to Barry curvature according to the quantum metric. And the formula is like this, okay? So it looks like some gradient of the component uh, of uh, quantum metric cross the electric field can give rise to some barrier curvature, additional barrier curvature. And this uh, Hall signal will be now pro uh, proportional to two electric fields. So this is a nonlinear uh, effect. And with uh, you know, the, the gradient of the quantum metric, and of course, we have to integrate over the entire Boolean zone. Uh, so this quantum metric has a different symmetry transformation under time reversal and inversion symmetry. There, uh, so 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 uh, it's a, a symmetric relation for both, and therefore uh, there is no such constraint that you have to break either inversion or time reversal to get a non-zero barrier curvature here. In, almost in any materials, as long as it's not a single orbital materials, you will have non-zero uh, non, non, uh, non quantum metric. But for the integral, okay, so this symmetric relation uh, will turn to an asymmetric uh, relation for this gradient. And then the integral will be zero, okay? Then therefore, we have to break both in order to have this one. Okay, so that means we need to, uh, to, to look for magnetic materials. So I will introduce this, the, uh, this material, magnesium territe, which is a topological antiferromagnet. It's a layered material. It's a Van der Waals layered material, which can be exfoliated, etc. So each Van der Waals material, uh, each Van der Waals layer is actually seven atomic layers. So the middle layer is magnesium, which carries the magnetic moment. And uh, you know, uh, you see between the adjacent layers, the moment are anti-aligned. That's why it's an anti-ferromagnet. So you know, we can produce the few layers. We can produce uh, three, uh, one layer, two layer, three layer, four layer, five layers. Uh, and it turns out 
If the layer number is odd, we will have this net magnetiz uh, magnetization. And uh, for five layers or three layers, and people found this translating state. Uh, so so there, uh, ha um, there is this quantized uh, norms Hall conductivity at zero magnetic field. If we have even number of layers, it's an uh, axial insulator with net uh, mag uh, magnetization. So uh, now let me uh, uh, explain a little bit why this material, the even layer of this material, is actually a nice system to explore quantum magic. So it has, it breaks, uh, it, uh, it has broken P parity, and also it has broken time reversal, but the PT symmetry is preserved, as you can if you follow these arrows. And with PT symmetry, the Bell curvature is zero everywhere but the quantum metric is not zero. So here we eliminate some you know, complicated involvement of the Berry curvature um, in the equilibrium state. Uh, but another thing, so in order to have this uh, you know, uh, gradient of the, of, of the quantum metric and integral uh, is not zero, uh, again, we have to break any rotational symmetry because we need some uh, directionality uh, here. And this, this Magnus Bismuth territe, if you look from the top down, it has rotational symmetry. And how to break that? So we decide to put this material on top of this material, black phosphorus. This one has C2, this one has C, uh, oh, sorry, this one has C3, this one has C2. And the consequence for putting them together is Nothing, right? Uh, and indeed, we can experimentally demonstrate that nothing uh, by <laughs> you know, performing angular resolved transport or optical SHG, and indeed we see the C, uh, C3 symmetry is broken. So here you all always have this C2 left due to this measurement. So yeah. Um, then uh, we... Uh, can do this nonlinear hall measurements. It's very similar to the previous case. It's basically inject a current at frequency omega and measure the two omega hall voltage. You have this quadratic relation. Yeah. But uh, putting black phosphorus is it not going to create strain fields on your sample? Uh. Yeah, I, I guess so, because the lattice mismatch and uh, et cetera, it must be. And how can you decouple the effects of strain from your data? Um, well, so it doesn't, um, well, on, uh, to some extent, it doesn't matter, right, if the strain also breaks the threefold rotation symmetry. So, so, so just from the fact that we have that effect, it doesn't matter where, yeah, please. So not necessarily needs to be black phosphorus. Can yeah, be yeah, you, you can just anything strain Anything that yeah. just strains your sample. Okay. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. The black phosphorus, the nice thing is, uh, um, you know, it, uh, it, well, first of all, strain measurement on 2D materials, controllable strain measurement is not easy. So, uh, and by putting it on the substrate, and this substrate has a, ba uh, a band gap about one EV, so most of the transport signatures are still coming from the, uh, the, 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 the magnesium cementarite or MBT. So it's just a um, kind of a nice way of doing that, but the strain measurement is definitely the same. Uh, okay, so this is the same as the barcode dipole um, nonlinear hall in terms of phenomenology. What is not the same is the uh, it's sensitive to the magnetic order in this uh, in this case. So uh, for this antiferromagnetic configurations, we can apply the E dot B field or by applying the circular polarized light, which has been demonstrated in these two papers, we can flip this uh, uh, AFM configuration. And by flipping this AFM configuration on new order, we can flip the two omega voltage signal um, with the linear response remaining the same. Okay? And further, we show this second order um, 
hot response uh, disappear above the new temperature, further uh, showing that this is associated with the magnetic uh, structure. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the last thing about this is again we can uh, we can we, we can demonstrate this wireless harvesting from these microwave signals, and we can generate the the the, the DC voltage, something that might be useful. Uh, so this has been discussed in these two papers, uh, yeah, just not a long time ago. Um, yeah, so, yeah, the take-home me message is the second-order Hall effect uh, reveals some new uh, physics as a new physical phenomenon. So, and this, this, this uh, effect does not require any magnetic field and does not require total magnetization. This is true for both the barricade dipole case and also for the quantum metric dipole case. Um, and uh, yeah, they can be uh, uh, arising from these intrinsic effects. But of course, all these other regimes and uh, scattering interaction effects are also interesting and it's just inevitable. Uh, so it could also be some new mechanism for uh, energy harvesting applications, but on a very early stage. That's it, and um, I'm happy to answer any more questions. Um, hi, I have a question. When you show where you measure the angle dependence of the nonlinear Hall effect, on the I think on the MBT you show that you also measure RxX, but on the sketch it looks like it only has two contacts. Always, are you measuring this in a two-contact configuration or? I mean here. Yeah, on the slide before where you mm. show the angle dependence, it looks like it's just a circle of contacts. So how do you get the RxX? So in yeah, so so we did both two probe measurements, okay. and also for four probe measurements, we use the nearby pair okay. of contacts for okay. the four probe measurement. Okay. Thank you. Both are consistent. Thanks. Hi. So in this layered system, the layer properties and the bulk properties are like totally different, right? Why why is it so? Sorry, can, can you Hi. say it again? Yeah. So in these uh, layered systems, the if you take two layer, three layer, these properties are absolutely different from the bulk properties. From the vial properties. Bulk, yeah, bulk, yeah. bulk. It's and not vial. Yeah. Why? Why is it so? And how many layers is a bulk? Like, if I have ten layer, is it a bulk or? Like <laughs> That's a very good question. I don't know the answer. Like, what is a crossover from the yeah. from the two D uh, limit two uh, D scenario to a three D scenario? I don't. I don't know. Yeah, um, experimentally, I think below 100 nanometers probably is in the 2D category. Yeah. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, my question is also about 3D. So you were just saying that in 2D you um, have restrictions on the rotation symmetries, right? So how would that look like in 3D systems? Is that the same? Uh, so, so in 3D system, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a bit more complicated and you have to um, figure out the space group symmetry. So, so, so here, in 2D, it's just the barrier curvature has only one component, right? And the barrier curvature dipole has to be in the 2D plane. And in 3D, then it can be any directions, the barrier curvature dipole, then you so, I mean, in principle, you can have the rotational symmetry, and it's just uh, along which direction now you have your barrier dipole. You just need to do the full analysis of the symmetry. Yeah. 